my Ko-Fi supporters see my videos first. Support me using the link in the description or on my channel. The mall is the heart of the factory. Every building, pipe, belt, inserter comes from the mall. If you want a dirty handcrafting heretic anywhere. But what if the factory was the mall? The tools we are given in Nullius, such as extensive crafting chains which benefit greatly from productivity, boxed items and recipes, multiple tiers of bots as well as a dozen tiers of upgrades for them, and some extremely efficient science recipes we're going to be getting into as the episode progresses, lend themselves to the mother of all bot bases. I immediately begin with polycrystalline silicon, for reasons I don't really remember. I'm sure I had some good reason or another, but it's beyond me at the present. The important bits anyway are the yield modules, which if you don't remember from earlier, are like productivity modules, but cost more power and speed and give a bit more productivity. Productivity is everything in this base, and although at the moment with my tier 2 buildings and productivity modules, I only get 10% productivity per recipe, essentially a 10% boost to output. If every step in a 7 item long chain had that productivity boost, that will already double the output from the same amount of input materials. Suffice to say, the recipe chains will get much longer than 7 items, and the productivity bonus is much greater by the end of the video. To offset the loss in crafting speed from these modules, I'm going to be covering the whole area in these large beacons. Just like that, we're producing polycrystalline silicon. For those of you concerned that a bot base doesn't exactly seem like the most interesting concept, that's because it isn't. I won't be focusing too much on this bit of a mod to be honest with you, as at this point the terraforming and life seeding is the important bit, and all this is just a means to an end, although I will update when anything interesting comes to fruition. While I'm here, I get the first two science packs set back up, since they're pretty simple and just use stuff that the new base is already producing anyway. Working towards the mechanical research pack, I realise that the boxed tier 1 mortar recipe is different to the unboxed one and needs insulated wire, so we're going to need to get rubber set up before we can really get anywhere. Unlike our problem with the mortars however, boxed rubber is the exact same as unboxed rubber, just with the values changed, so I won't be re-explaining that process. Going forward here, if I make any recipes I've done before, we'll just skip over it for the sake of brevity and to save some brain space for the new stuff. I also do steel while I'm at it since we're going to need it at some point. You'll remember that the steel plate and rod recipes need sulfuric acid, so we're going to need to set up a proper robust volcanic gas separation build. Even though we don't need boric acid yet, I make sure that from the get-go the production line is able to balance it, switching to a recipe which doesn't produce it when there is enough in the chest. I also got aluminum component foundries ready for when the new aluminum recipe finishes researching, so I can just set the electrolyzers and let it rip. Although, I had managed to forget to place pipes to remove the oxygen from them, so it wasn't as simple as I might have liked it to be. We're midway through researching a new mechanical research recipe, which is ridiculously more efficient than the old one, but takes much more advanced resources. Specifically, it turns 3 steel wire boxes and a tier 3 pump box into 25 boxes of mechanical research. That's pretty good, I think. And even if by direct comparison it might be a bit more expensive, can't really be bothered to check. The productivity from the extra steps almost certainly makes it cheaper. It does mean, however, we need to make tier 3 pumps, which is its own whole can of worms, starting with these tier 2 motors I've been building in the background. The worst bit of making tier 3 pumps is making tier 3 motors, which are going to need epoxy, as well as just a load of other materials. Epoxy is the important one, however, as it can't just be botted together, it needs actual thought, which begins here where I make a small solvent build. I've just sort of shoved it under the briny electrolysis area, so it needs to be sort of spread out to avoid the pipes running through. Skipping a lot of steps here, as it's all previously been explored, I get an epoxy build put together, which is opening us up to both pump tier freeze and fiberglass, which is needed in a lot of the higher tier buildings. For the final time now, I feel the need to acknowledge that I'm skipping massive amounts of work here. If you felt like you were missing out on something, here's a time lapse of what I was doing. Literal hours of mall building. Unfortunately a victim of my admittedly convenient bot base is that it's approximately as fun to watch build as watching paint dry. When I get to the biology and terraforming, then we can slow down and enjoy the ride. 
Something else incredibly useful tier 3 pumps unlocked for us was tier 3 wind power, which is a 3 times power boost from the tier 2 turbines, but unfortunately has the same downfall as its predecessors. It's incredibly unreliable. For this reason I start to try always to store power, rather than just tanking the downtime like I have been so far. Starting with a steam battery. Unfortunately as I discover, boilers cannot be set to surge, meaning they'll always try to pull power, and therefore aren't really suitable for storing it. My next idea for power storage is a compressed gas storage and decompression facility. This is basically a more thought out version of the nitrogen battery from the starter base. I compress a common gas using surplus power, and when there is a dip in power, decompress it through a closed turbine to reclaim some of that power. My initial plan was to use nitrogen, but I realised I had a lot of oxygen just being vented away from the algae farm, so I decided to use that instead. You will notice, I didn't actually leave any tanks for the uncompressed gas, so until I fix that later on, the turbines will just back up when it decompresses, there's nowhere for that gas to go. As it turns out, Placing turbines while you're in a Spidertron is an absolute jank fest. The turbine's airspace, the area around it in which you can't place other turbines, is not something the player can usually collide with. Despite this, when placing or upgrading a turbine, it seems to cause the Spidertron to recalculate its footing, causing the poor little guy to trip the fuck out whenever we place one. Just look at him go. With my power only slightly stabilised, it's time to start spending it. I waste a massive amount of resources with these modulus assemblers, so I set to upgrade them out of tier 2 and get some yield modules into them. I start to set up the science drop offs from the bot base, but at the moment I'm just letting the old base keep providing most of it, since that's basically all it's going to be good for soon, especially as more and more intermediates are taken over by the bot base. We just finished a new research, which is going to allow us to separate trace gas from residual gas separation further into helium, volcanic gas and methane. Volcanic gas and methane are moderately useful I suppose, but helium is the real important resource. It's going to be used in a multitude of important items, from higher tier heat pipes and stirling engines, to circuits, to even a type of nuclear fuel once we get around to that later. It is an incredibly important resource and is literally made out of thin air. We tank up the helium so we can pass a production checkpoint, research, connect the methane to the bus, and just void the volcanic gas because nobody cares about it. Back at the bot area, I set up tier 2 logistic bots, since the mall was struggling to replace all the tier 1s. Talking about bots, my character itself is an android, so I don't see any reason why there can't be more than one of me. I produce a second body, but when placing it down I can't quite seem to transfer my consciousness to it. I do some academic research into why this is, but can't see any reason. The problem in the end was that, despite the android body literally taking a chassis to craft, I need to put another one in it to actually pilot it. Once I've done that, I can swap between the bodies to my heart's content. It sounds really useful, in theory, but in the end, the only use I have for it is to have a body to start all of the two dozen or so artillery remotes this mod has later on. Once again, I am a victim of forgetting to unpause OBS. What I was doing while it was paused was building this lithium build. Basically, we process a massive amount of brine to extract a small amount of lithium chloride, and then we can electrolyze the lithium chloride to create lithium and chlorine. Processing all of that brine creates silly amounts of salt, but we can just combine any overflow with fresh water to make seawater, and then void the seawater. This lithium can then be used in a nanofabricator, along with a few other resources to make tier 2 batteries, used in a lot of advanced buildings later on. I quickly run around and set up some barreling pumps, as I'm currently researching an improved chemical research recipe, which requires a few barreled fluids. With no confidence in my gas battery, I start working on an accumulator field here instead, because although it's expensive, it's dead simple. Finally, the mod has judged that we've trudged through enough regular science to get back to some biology. So I'm researching botany, which is going to give us access to grass. I stir into action soon before the research finishes, as there are a few things I need to set up to begin actually growing grass. You see, by combining ammonia, nitric acid, sludge, algae and cellulose, we can get fertiliser, a key ingredient in growing grass. Completely incapable of doing just one thing at a time, 
I then run over and set up grass genomes, since we're going to need them to make the first grass. It takes nucleotides, bacteria, algae genomes and geology research, spitting out grass genomes and wastewater. You can see here, I'm starting to connect all of my wastewater to a central waste pipe, rather than dealing with it locally. There is a good reason for this, we're going to get around to later. I also start making grass progenitors. The next step in our bootstrapped grass, as well as an ingredient of the botanical research pack, which takes sugar, cellulose, algae genomes, pr protocells, amino acids and fatty acids, as well as spitting out more wastewater. Finally, I get back to the fertiliser. It still needs sludge, which isn't something I'm used to needing to actually produce. Initially, my idea is to split wastewater into sludge and seawater, and then just punt the seawater out of an outflow to leave only the sludge. Although this is not the grand purpose of wastewater, I was alluding to a moment ago. We also need brown landfill to grow grass, effectively acting as the dirt we grow it in. We can get brown landfill by combining grey and tan landfill, both made by mixing different amounts of gravel and sand, and some more sludge. This is another thing about this mod that I love. Byproducts were previously seen as completely useless or a means to an end, coming back around and being used in key important production chains. We've seen it with nitrogen earlier, sludge now, and as I've said we're going to see it a bit later with wastewater. Almost nothing in the mod doesn't serve multiple purposes. And whilst by no means is this mod perfect, it certainly gives the impression it's been incredibly well thought out. Now for the balanced criticism, there's so many damn items in this mod I get lost looking through my inventory. Anyway, so with grass progenitors, brown landfill, fresh water and air, we can actually start producing grass. Similar to algae, we need to process the grass into seeds before we can turn it into more grass. This is done by combining the grass with water in a tier 3 crusher, which in turn gives us grass seeds along with cellulose and sludge. The sludge can get put back into the system to be used up, the cellulose we make available to the logistic network to be used elsewhere, and the grass seeds we will take over to the setup where we're actually going to grow the grass. Talking about growing grass, it's done in these hydro plants by combining grass seeds, fertiliser, brown landfill, air and fresh water, giving us grass, oxygen and sludge in return. Once that's all hooked up, we get our first naturally produced grass. Well, as natural as it gets anyway, which we then need to hook back up to that grass crusher. I don't hook up the other hydro plants just yet, although I do get them ready, because with so few seeds in the system, they might get spread so thinly between them that none of them actually have enough to grow more grass, but as the process picks up, I'll connect them up. We also have the possibility now of an overflow of sludge in the system, so I set up a hydro plant which will void it in that case, so that nothing backs up. See again here, me getting hopelessly lost, looking through my inventory, even after 100 hours in this mod. I get my eyes set on the prize of our efforts here, a way to make sugar naturally by milling grass seeds. To research it though, we're going to need to set up botanical research meaning it's time to put this grass to use. The research pack itself needs a grass progenitor, a lot of grass, and a lot of boxes of cellulose. There is a common theme among the biology research packs from here on out, where they take a progenitor of the organism, a load of the organism itself, and then something the organism produces a lot of. What we're mostly waiting on is for the grass seeds to back up, so we stop consuming grass making them, and some can be spared in the science production. Whilst I wait, I do prepare where we will mill the grass seeds. Essentially, I want them to only be milled when there is enough grass in the box to continue producing science, so our sugar production isn't jeopardising our science production, as it takes minutes to make a single science pack as it is. Also, we're in a position now where we make more cellulose than we consume, which will only get worse when grass seed milling comes online, as that also produces cellulose, so I need to set up a system to burn any extra. This has the added benefit of producing some graphite for us. Finally, we've gotten to the point where some grass is finding its way to the science assembler, and not too long after, the first science pack finishes, as well as the second beginning to produce right after. I've already got my eyes on the next organism, worms, but we have a few more regular researches to wrestle through before we get to those. 
As soon as I have enough science packs, I start researching grass seed milling. The existing sugar build is a massive drain on resources, and still isn't really enough, so the sooner I can get rid of it, the better. The moment the research is finished, I'm straight on building the setup. We don't even need much production, just two crushes will give us far more than enough sugar for f basically free compared to what we were doing before. I also got a better cellulose burning recipe, so I jumped straight on that too. I waste no time ripping up the old sugar build. Up to this point, I have been making titanium in my mall in a little build I didn't think was notable enough to talk about, but it's becoming woefully insufficient for my needs, so it's time to put a proper build together, starting out with planning it in Helmod. Initially, I planned for a yellow belt of the unboxed stuff, so a fifth of a yellow belt of boxed titanium ingots. The only resources I need shipping in for this new titanium recipe are limestone and sandstone, which we can share a single cybersyn train station drop off by using filtered loaders. Starting with processing the limestone first, we need to begin by crushing it into crushed limestone, the stone byproduct of which we can just ship off to join all the other stone byproducts from the other processes. I returned to find that when I added the two new loaders to the sandstone side, I had forgotten to give them a filter, meaning I have to fix that and then dump the misplaced limestone over to the right warehouse by hand. Anyway, so by combining the crushed limestone with hydrochloric acid, we get liquid calcium chloride, which we then dehydrate into its solid form in these distilleries. The calcium chloride is then electrolyzed into calcium and chlorine, the latter we can just send off to be voided. That is the extent of the limestone side for now. We need to process the sandstone next. The first step is crushing a lot of sandstone into a lot of sand and stone. The stone byproduct again just being sent away, and the sand being combined with sulfuric acid to create our old friend rutile. The next step is to combine the rutile, calcium chloride and calcium in large furnaces to create titanium ingots, lime and more chlorine. It's nothing but a mistake to give me bobs inserters. Pickled titanium components need nitric acid, so we get those set up, and that's basically our titanium issues sorted for now and forever. The next important research which finishes is the one for wormies. I'm not going to explain how the worm genomes and progenitors are made, since it is so similar to the other times we've done it. The difference being now, we need a chemical called oil, which is made by combining fatty acids and glycerol. Now, wormies are the first fauna we've created on this planet, so it follows that rather than producing oxygen, they require it. Furthermore, worms feed on waste, meaning we also need to provide them with sludge to reproduce. Overall, the recipe to turn worm eggs into a real worm is by combining worm eggs with sand, grass, oxygen and sludge which gives us more worm eggs, worms, and carbon dioxide. Whilst we wait for enough worm eggs to produce from the bootstrap recipe to kickstart the process for real, another research finishes which immediately pulls my attention. You see, that sacred purpose for wastewater I had been alluding to up to now has come to fruition, as it is actually a key source of an incredibly important chemical, heavy water. We'll talk about heavy water more in a moment after we've discussed how it's made. Almost all of the wastewater byproduct in the base is being pushed to this one tank near the end of a bus, from which we can pull it up here to be separated into heavy water, sludge, and a metric tonne of saline water. It is of course only the heavy water we care about, so the other two can be flushed away. For the moment however, the purpose of the heavy water is going to remain a mystery, as enough wormies have accumulated that we can start breeding them properly. Since worms and eggs are both produced equally, we need some way to get rid of them. And that way is... well... We can just connect the worm shake up to the sludge pipes to be fed back into its ancestors. Of course, a worm's true purpose is to be bottled up with one of its progenitors in pure carbon dioxide and shipped off to be zapped in a lab. And what can I say? My hands are tied and that is what I must do. With the wormy processing line functional and running at full pelt, I have a new item to start producing, red circuits. It's not really that interesting except for the fact that it's now our first use of helium. Our first research with wormy research packs, nematology research if you're a nerd, finishes, which gives us some funky ways to process worms and then turn them into amino acids and some other useless stuff. 
Wonder what's going on in here? Well, I like to think they're squeezing the amino acids out of them like this. With us getting amino acids from worms now, we can get rid of a massive nanofabricator build for that too. Even better, if we crush worm eggs with a bit of solvent, we get nucleotides as well as more amino acids, meaning the only pillar of life we still need to nanofabricate is fatty acids. I mentioned a new chemical research recipe earlier, but couldn't find the bit of footage where I built it, very possibly lost from OBS being paused. So here is where I actually built the thing. We also just knocked a new tier of modules, so I spend a bit of time setting them up in the bot base. I realised now how daft it was to be wasting my precious wastewater to make sludge for the biology area, so instead I decide to melt mineral dust with sulfuric acid to make the sludge needed. Finally, the purpose of heavy water reveals itself. Heavy water is a slight misnomer, as it actually appears to be a mixture of heavy water and super heavy water, and by electrolyzing this mixture we break it down into its constituent parts, oxygen, deuterium and tritium. Tritium and deuterium are incredibly important resources, as if you bash them together hard enough, each pair that fuse release a helium atom, a neutron, and a tasty 17.1 mega electron volts of energy. That is to say, a lot of energy from not a lot of material. We don't quite have the equipment yet to make use of this new energy source, but deuterium and tritium are hard to come by, so I'd like to start stockpiling them now. I've just recently unlocked tier 3 robotics, so I get the robot frame set up in the mall for when my research finishes for the logistic bots themselves. And when the bots are ready, I get this little thing placed down to slowly replace all of the tier 2 bots. With our biology research, we unlock our first recipe that includes a non-biological material, that being textiles. By adding cellulose into the mix, our textile recipe becomes much more efficient and I look forward to more improved recipes in the future. After all this time, some of the materials in the old base are running dry, so I've started placing boxes, which request boxed materials from the new base, and make them available to the old base in their unboxed form. One does start to wonder if we're producing algae in a facility using the very air and water we're pulling directly from the environment, then why not cut out the middleman? Why not seed algae on the surface of the planet? Well, that's exactly what the algaculture drone is for. For the low, low cost of an algae progenitor, a scout drone, bacteria barrels, and a lot of algae spores, and some mineral dust, we can launch our very own algae colonies into nearby water sources, beginning the conversion of this barren planet into a lush utopia. Very soon, our first drone is produced. All that's left to do now is launch it. And ooh, what's this? This, people, is quite literally what we were put on this planet for. We have a list of objectives, all to do with terraforming, and not until every single one of these is completed will we see the victory screen. If you look on the left, you'll see that one agriculture drone advanced the algae condition by 1.05%, meaning we're going to launch about 100 of these to get it done which itself is only one of the 13 items on the list. I immediately get to work launching more and more algaculture drones. Not just to finish the algae coal, but also because as we release more and more plants into the wild, and they can photosynthesize in the open air, it will slowly begin passively increasing the oxygen goal too. It's not long until every body of water within range of my drone launcher is stuffed to the gills with algae, so I build an artillery train to take the drones farther afield. I first launch a barrage of scout drones to actually locate the bodies of water, and then follow up with the agriculture drones. Algae prefers the shallower water near the coast, so I'm basically out here doing a connect the dots with the borders of the lakes. The process begins anew at a different point on the train network, and with us already at nearly 80% on the algae goal, I was hoping this would finish the goal, but unfortunately we were just barely short and didn't have enough drones on board. I return with a vengeance, and just like that, terraforming goal 1 of 13 is complete. At our mall, I get nuclear reactors set up, 
There is not so long left now until we're going to be able to make use of these. More importantly however, we've just unlocked trees, so it's time to start up that whole process, beginning of course with the genomes and progenitors. I waste no time getting started with the bootstrap tree recipe. I can build the actual farming setup whilst I wait for this to do its thing. Oh, I cannot do that. And instead go build a fusion cell setup. Taking just a canister, tritium and deuterium, they look quite cheap really, but might I remind you that tritium is worth 40,000 times its weight in gold. Just a few units of the stuff takes a whole lot of wastewater processing. Each one of these cells holds 3 gigajoules of energy, which would satiate the current power consumption of my base for like 2 or 3 seconds. But once you begin to consider the neighbour bonus of reactors, the efficiency increases quite a lot. Back to the trees then. If you want to turn a tree seed into a tree, you need to feed it a stable diet of wormies, tan landfill, fertiliser, fresh water and air as well as it's going to spit out a bit of sludge and oxygen. The trees themselves we just toss into a wood chipper which gives us tree seeds, wood, wood chips and sludge. Once we have our wormingtons and the rest belted in, we can begin very slowly producing trees. Trees are the highest form of plant life we're going to seed on the planet, so they do take quite a while to grow. In retrospect, if I was being smart, I would have made a much larger setup for these guys. I paused OBS, and upon unpausing, I was coming close to finishing this nuclear reactor. I'm gonna be honest, boiling water is very unnecessary when sterling engines exist. But for some reason, I could be bothered to build this whole thing, but not set up a single assembler for tier 3 sterling engines. So this is what we're stuck with for now. It's built using closed turbines, meaning most of the steam which is used up is condensed back into water, but I still need to build this water purification setup to top up what is lost. Given how precious tritium is, I don't want to waste it, so I get to work figuring out how to only insert fuel when the heat drops. The idea is that a fuel cell is only inserted when a used cell is removed from the reactor, and empty cells are only removed when a specific condition is met, so that when the reactor temperature drops below a certain threshold, fuel is inserted one at a time until it gets back above that threshold hopefully wasting no heat to a reactor that's already at its capacity. The hard bit is of course figuring out how to measure the reactor's temperature, which this thing with tier 1 heat pipes does poorly, so I'm better off finding a different way. Whilst considering my options, I set up a way to empty the used fuel cells. Like I mentioned earlier, tritium deuterium fusion creates helium, so we have some of that come out, as well as wastewater to empty, giving us back the canister half of the time. The reactors themselves seem to be working well, I just need to spend some time improving water flow, as it's causing some turbines to back up. In the end, the answer for controlling the reactor is simpler than I could have imagined. As you see, the Nullius Maximus mod pack includes the Inventory Sensor mod, which, when placed next to a heat tank, will tell you its temperature, and using this information, we just remove fuel when the temperature is less than 1000 degrees. We get a new electrical research recipe unlocked, which takes red circuits, tier 2 batteries, and tier 2 sensors, producing a lot of electrical research boxes. Again, I don't really know if it's materially cheaper, but it's certainly more convenient. With those fusion cells we've been producing, we can also start making nuclear bombs. I probably won't be using them much on their own, but they're an important part of some of the terraforming drones we'll soon be making use of. Here's a bit of nuking though, because of course, I couldn't resist. I ultimately realised that between power and all these bombs, my tritium stars would take a nosedive, so my next plan was to try to up production. Most of my wastewater in the base was already going to heavy water, but what if I started producing some for the singular purpose of producing the heavy water? It's quite simple really. Use seawater separation to create saline and wastewater, and then dump the saline water whilst keeping the wastewater, to be separated further into more saline water heavy water, and sludge. Again, voiding the saline water, but turning the sludge into more waste water to be fed back into the system. Then, for good measure, I made another one. You might have remembered whilst I was doing all of this, that what I was meant to be doing was sorting out trees, so I get back around to doing that. Dendrology research, the study of trees, required the usual suspects for biology research. The organism, being 80 trees, a progenitor, so a tree progenitor, 
and then something the organism produces a lot of, so 200 boxes of wood. Somehow, crush all that together into a conical flask, which surely must create one of the densest fluids in the universe given how much we're putting into that little thing, and it gets zapped in a dome to release truths about life, the universe, and trees. Now, we need to find something to do with all the excess wood we're going to make, so my plan is to crush any excess wood we have into wood chips, and then, if we have too many wood chips, to turn them into graphite, which should hopefully balance out the system. We're entering into an eve now, where biological technologies actually require more than a dozen packs per research, and therefore this tiny science setup no longer well serves our purpose. I replace it instead with this larger setup, which should work for us for most of the rest of the run. Also around now, the technology finishes researching to allow us to craft rocket fuel, and having clearly surpassed any care in the world for order and organisation, I just dump the build into the middle of what should have been my fluid bus. It works of course, but it's not what I'd like to call an elegant solution. Amusingly here, I tried to put a blue belt box into a module insert slot by accident and it crashed the game. Feeling like it comes around faster every time, our next organism presents itself, fish. Again, we begin with genomes and progenitors, and then we start putting together the farm. The humble fish lives on a diet of algae, worms, seawater and oxygen, and is rich in oils we may find useful. Before I do finish my business with the fishies, however, a research checkpoint necessitates that I launch a deep excavation drone. Make no mistake of what this is. It's a barrel packed to its gills with nuclear weapons, and it leaves a hole befitting of the concept. So, fish, yeah. Before we can really get anywhere, we need to get a few eggs made using the bootstrap recipe, so I get a temporary flotation cell made for that. And while that's ongoing, we can look at a new tool, terraforming drones. Some wisp of knowledge liberated from zapping a science flask informed us of the possibility that, if you blew one of those big holes into the ground and then immediately dropped several hundred metric tons of dirt on top of it, you can get rid of pesky barren land and replace it with arable land. This aligns with the terraform goal in the tab on the left, which wants us to replace a load of black, purple and volcanic land with something a bit more conducive to life. You can see it in action here. Watch as we replace this barren black terrain and the terraform goal creeps up. The demand from all of the fertilizer and soon the fish and my algae supply was beginning to cause a shortage. So I built a whole new algae farm to compensate I also set up tier 2 solar panels and grid batteries in my mall, as these are ingredients for satellites and we are now on the lead up to our next science, which would require launching satellites into orbit. All the while now, the barrage of soil continues, slowly creeping up the terraform goal. Whilst rearranging my chassis equipment grid, I made the timeless mistake. Still waiting on the fishies to craft due to a crippling nucleotide shortage, I build an extra grass farm so I can breed more wormies and melt more wormy eggs into nucleotides. Still waiting on fishies, I start the process of upgrading all of the labs. Speed isn't a concern, but the extra module slot it provides means we get even more productivity, which over enough time, the cost of the lab and the module is negligible and it's essentially free science. I missed the finishing of the terraforming goal due to more OBS pausing shenanigans, but it's just a load of dirt, who cares anyway. I also get a new tier of chassis with a ridiculously large equipment grid and immediately fill it with everything I can think of. Having suffered the baby spidertron for so long, finally reaching the point now where I have access to a big spidertron is a massive relief. This thing is a beast, much faster with a massive storage and equipment grid as well as literally having two artillery cannons strapped to it for short range drone launching. Aware that one day this planet must be seeded with biters, I decide it's a good idea to start digging out a moat around an island where I'll house them. Unfortunately, super nukes don't mix well with short range drone launchers, so I try that again, launching the super nukes into the literal corner of my screen and still running away each time to make sure I'm safe. It is super safe until you forget to do it, and then you're super not safe. Finally, it's time for the fish science, ichthyology research. You know how it goes, fish progenitor, a lot of fish, 
And finally, the mystery third ingredient this time is a lot of wastewater. Soon, probably my most anticipated technology finishes, Ecology 2, which unlocks grass drones. But to be honest, even with the dirt drones, this environment sucks. So it's time to make it look a bit less sucky. Launching a horticulture drone gives us a massive lag spike and an even larger patch of grass, contributing towards the grass goal. I immediately get to work covering as much of my base in grass as possible, as it's far prettier than the mishmash of barren terrain we had previously. Although it's been hours since we started creating life on this planet, this is the first time the place has really felt alive. Of course, our biter island needs to be fully covered in grass. Whilst we've been focusing so much on biology recently, a massive development in our material sciences has occurred. I place down rocket silos, and it's finally time to divert some of our attention to the stars and what they can offer to us. You'll notice that I've placed two rocket silos, and although we'll only be launching satellites in one, there is a good reason for the other, as you will see later. Suffice to say, these rockets take a lot of materials. I won't list them all, but you can see how many requests I've had to make in this logistics chest. Rather than having to craft a hundred rocket parts like in vanilla, the rocket is crafting as a single, very expensive part, which means every time the productivity bar fills, we get an entire rocket for free. The massive lag spikes here are just from me launching grass drones in the background. Satellites take their own mess of components, and each one we launch gives us a hundred boxes of astronomical research, or 500 packs. I set a circuit condition on the silo to only insert a satellite if there is room in storage to fit the science packs. As similar to vanilla, if a satellite launches with no room to put the science packs, you use the satellite but still don't get the science. I'm placing more beacons when the first rocket finishes crafting, and it is a magnificent sight after 140 hours. It's not even the end, not even nearly the end but it made me feel that much closer to finishing this juggernaut of a mod. Just as suddenly as it started, it's over, and it's time to get back into the grind. The other rocket pops out of its silo too, but it'll be a while yet before we get any use out of it. Rather than do anything fancy with belts to get this 7th science pack into the labs, I instead decide to simply use requester chests to get them into the first row of labs, from which they have then proliferated as usual. With all of the progenitors we're going to need to use between science packs and drones, I've actually got a genome shortage, so I set up these nanofabricators to make a lot more of the first few genomes. Another massive shortage we're having is rocket fuel, to solve which, my first step is to build a larger explosive build. I didn't talk about this new explosive recipe much when I first made it, but it's another one of those recipes which have been massively improved by the introduction of biology. Comparing it with the old recipe, we're basically adding a bit more glycerol, some cellulose, and aluminum powder, and getting four times more explosives. That's a trade I'm more than willing to make. Easily my favourite part of pasting builds is the wall of bots that arrive to do my bidding, which you can sort of see in the corner here. Rocket fuel is the same as before, but this time, I've got together a much prettier build. I can let you know what the other rocket silo does now, as I've just unlocked the asteroid mining technology. Essentially, we launch up a rocket with a miner, and it has a chance to catch an asteroid, which we can guide down to the planet, making our own ore patches or enriching those we already have. As I set up the launches for the guiding drones, you'll notice that there are six of them, despite the planet only having four types of resources, not counting fumaroles. Well you see, that's the problem. The planet lacks in heavy elements like copper and uranium, and it's our job to bring some down from space. Not only are they required for the terraforming goals, but also because they are of immense use to us. Copper for more advanced electronics, and uranium for fission power, which is a lot cheaper than fusion. The first guide drone I get is for an iron ore meteorite, which I target at my main iron mine adding more than 2 million ore to the patch. I soon get my first copper drone too, which I shoot over to the left of my titanium setup, where I plan to process the copper. You'll see, it also bumped up the copper goal on the left. We still have some research to do before we can process that copper, so in the meantime, I work on a new type of nuclear fuel we've just researched. You see, some guy figured out that if you smack a high energy neutron into a lithium atom, you split it into tritium and helium. So by using this process we can turn fission cells into more tritium than it took to make them, effectively breeding the tritium. 
Once the breeder cell has been used up in a reactor, we can just empty out the tritium and helium, as well as a bit of lithium, and use the tritium to make more fusion cells to make more breeder cells. I use this pair of reactors to burn the cells, which gives us a free bit of power in the process of giving us the massive amount of power all this extra tritium will provide. Back on the biological end of progress, I've started turning fish into oil, and the eggs into nucleotides. This is going to be important in a moment, but first I'm pleased to announce that we just got our first uranium guide drone. For some reason, I decided to launch it into the boonies. I suppose I thought I was going to use that bauxite patch at some point, or maybe it's just my residual disgust for building over our patches. Anyway, so if we combine the oil with steam, we split it into fatty acids and glycerol, and just like that, all of the pillars of life are being produced by biological means. With the copper processing tech researched, it's about time we get down to work processing it. Naturally, this begins with mining the copper itself. The copper is then crushed before being combined with a mix of sulfuric acid and solvent, which dissolves it into copper solution. We then zap the copper out of the solution in the electrolyzer, giving us copper ingots, which we can then turn into sheets and wires. Now for uranium processing. The first step is actually to barrel up some tritium, as it is needed in the process, and sending tritium over by pipe is a waste with such a low volume resource. In preparation for the new age of cheap nuclear power that uranium will provide us, I actually bother to set up tier 3 sterling engines. They take a lot of helium and other expensive materials, but for convenience they are unparalleled. Again, the first step in uranium processing is to actually mine the stuff, and in a move not common for Nullius, it's actually easier than vanilla, as it requires no fluid inputs to mine. The facade of relative ease is shattered when we start crushing, which spits out mineral dust I'm going to simply shunt off onto the logistics network. The crushed uranium can then be combined with sulfuric acid, which gives us yellow cake, a precursor for further nuclear material. If we bake the yellow cake with soda ash, we get uranium, gravel, and sulfur dioxide. If I was being 100% efficient, I could feed the gas back to make more sulfuric acid, but I just don't care enough to do anything but void it. Combining uranium with tritium gives us enriched uranium, deuterium, and mineral dust. We still haven't finished research for fission cells, so right now, this is as far as we can go with this line. Just a quick aside, I also unlocked a new insulation recipe, using wood, to add onto the pile of recipes which have benefited from our biological research. Pretty soon, the research for fission cells finishes, and all they take to craft is steel sheets, uranium, and enriched uranium, giving us a handy 4 gigajoules of energy, for less tritium than a fusion cell costs. I start to trial a 3x3 reactor, as with this layout, the central reactor, would get the maximum neighbour bonus possible. Four reactors would get a three-sided neighbour bonus, and the other four would get a two-sided neighbour bonus, a massive efficiency boost overall. In vanilla, this isn't feasible without having to hand-feed the central reactor, but we have some tools in this run that change that. Those tools are a suite of logistics buildings introduced from Renai Transportation, which are going to allow us to throw in items from afar. I end up with this, and although the method of fuel cell delivery is different, the philosophy is largely the same as the last reactor. Only add cells when one is removed, and only remove cells when the reactor temperature is low. You can see how using the Stirling engines make this build far simpler than the old reactor. Why stop at two reactor setups though? I might as well add another while I'm at it, and then why not add a third one entirely to utilise breeder cells? It's around here I finally get a use for copper, as we've just unlocked blue circuits. At the moment, they don't really serve any use, but they're going to be required in some advanced modules and equipment. Soon, I get back into the boonies to cut off this piece of land I selected to be my biter sanctuary. We've just recently unlocked wormy drones, which are going to allow us to deposit worms into the wild. I begin immediately depositing them along the south shore of my biter island. The first few increase the worm goal, but don't seem to actually be doing any worming at all, only leaving weird marks on the surface, but soon we start to see some good old wormies poking out. I just recently unlocked antimatter traps, 
which when burned in a reactor turn into antimatter capsules, which we're going to use later, but I'm setting it up now as a surprising amount of the materials for the final goal are able to be made already, including this one. Something else we need to think about now is carbon sequestration, as pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere will help to increase our oxygen goal. And the graphite this produces we're going to need anyway later to turn into coal for the coal mission objective. I use this extremely fast graphite recipe to rapidly use up a lot of carbon dioxide, and the graphite will just store for now in this field of storage chests. At the same time, I'm continuing my worm invasion of the planet, and by now, big worms are starting to appear. Our final organism finally finished researching, the humble biter, or arthropod as the mod calls them, and we of course begin with the genomes and then the progenitors. The requirements to produce biters verge on silly, as it eats fish, wood chips, water, oxygen, as well as, for a bit of crunch, pistols and ammunition boxes. The science packs take the usual progenitor and biters, as well as a lot of plastic, as the biter's particular niche is as a biological source of plastic and graphene, although I don't make a massive amount of use of this. The immediate sense I had, looking at all the biology I'd built, was that we were going to need more, so that's exactly what I'm going to do next. That begins with flattening out this whole area to the west to build it. However much algae we had before, I'll have four of them. However much grass I had before, I'll have two of those please. Make it four, actually. How many wormies did we have before? Oh well, we're going to need at least four times that. Fishies? Couldn't get enough of the little fellas, bring them in. Trees, never had enough of the bastards, deforestation and all that. Biters, only just met the buggers, but will I, I'll have a couple of them. Combining methanol and fatty acids gives biodiesel. Combining that with nitrogen, rubber and graphite gives us coal, which although being absolutely useless to us really, we can shot into a drone and punt into the ground to trap some carbon from the atmosphere and add a few percentages to our coal goal. We will also have to start making petroleum soon for a similar purpose. Queuing up the final research required to finish the mod, we can see it really isn't that far away. Our new biology setup gives me access to an unprecedented amount of fish. For us to turn into oil into fatty acids into diesel into coalify, as well as turn into oil into fatty acids into petroleum if I, Coal we've already spoken about, but petroleum I'll explain. By combining fatty acids, propane and compressed hydrogen, we get petroleum. 10,000 barrels of which can be put into a drone and shot into the ground to lock away some carbon and hydrogen, as well as fulfilling some of the petroleum mission objective. Even though my production probably can't keep up with it right now, I copy down another biology lab setup, because I'm clearly feeling very optimistic. I utilise, quite possibly, the most beneficial biology recipe yet, where we blend biters into cellulose, plastic and graphene. Up until this point, graphene was immensely expensive and time consuming to make, so for it now to be produced so freely is of massive benefit. Something else I just unlocked was the highest tier of modules, which is going to be our first and highest demand use for blue circuits, as tier 3 haste modules use them. My first use for tier 3 yield modules is all my labs and rocket silos naturally. By now I'd collected so many guide drones, I decided to just swap both silos to producing science. Our next big milestone research is next, tree drones. Trees need to be grown on grass and near worms, so my first target for them is of course the Biter Island, which is already inundated with worms. I waste no time covering as much surface area with trees as possible, as the oxygen goal is still far from done, and this third species of plant should hopefully put oxygen production into overdrive. The natural enemy of trees is fumaroles for some reason. They won't grow anywhere near the things, so my natural reaction is to go and nuke them out of existence and then pave it over with dirt and grass. And for those wondering, yes, the worms are hostile to us. It's not long, as it turns out, until we complete the tree objective. Things are speeding up now, as not long after finishing that objective, we unlock fish drones to start cracking away at the next objective. 
Whilst everything is happening from now on, it might be worth keeping an eye on how fast the oxygen goal grows with all these plants we've sent out. Fish just need to be placed in water near algae, and my first drone gets launched into the lake just north of my base here. I'm focusing a lot of the fish drones around the shores of the biter island, as they're actually a requirement for biters to survive. It doesn't take very long at all for the fish objective to complete, although I do still keep fish drone production going in case I need to make anywhere else habitable to bite us later. Here's a quick time lapse of the base whilst I wait for stuff to research. By this point in the run, I was beginning to get slightly tired and spent more and more of my time just AFKing, coming back to work on any bottlenecks or important new researches. Another quick update on the tech tree, we only have 12 technologies remaining until the end of the run now. I spent a bit of time here prettying up my starting area is by the end of the run, I wanted it to look like it had never been touched by technology. Realising I didn't have a backup for if the biter island can't hold all the biters I need for the objective, I set to work digging a moat by way of nuclear bombs around my base. Once I completed the coal objective, I can at least focus all of my oil into making petroleum, which should massively speed up that objective. Biter drones finish researching, so I get the drone launcher set up for them. You'll notice I've surrounded the launcher in walls, and there is a good reason for that you're going to see momentarily. Biter drones actually require shackles to craft, which up until this point I had assumed was some sort of troll item, since all they seem to do is slow down the player if you put them in your equipment grid. Unfortunately, I neglected to place a Renai hatch on the launcher to catch the thrown biter drone, so the first one just got eaten. I didn't realise this was what the issue was, and I ended up just using a regular inserter in the end. Anyway, time for the moment of truth. I launched my first biter drone out onto the island, and it successfully plants a nest. Fantastic. I get to work planting more, and quickly we're starting to build a community of the brutes. As a cherry on top, the oxygen goal finishes around now, leaving us only three more objectives to complete, two of which we're already working on. You're about to find out the reason for those walls now, as we have a containment breach whilst launching new nests. I knew it could happen, which is why I built the walls, but I expected the biter to spawn from the launcher, not like 10 tiles away outside the walls. I dispatch it anyway, but it's clear these walls cannot be trusted. We're researching laser turrets to automatically kill biters, or as the description says, train mobile organic life forms to remain in their designated habitat. But if I'm honest with you, I'll probably finish the biter objective before the research finishes. Every nest we launch increases evolution, so pretty quickly we have crowds of large biters and spitters. I even launched some nests at my old base, hoping the biters might demolish it so I don't have to, but I forget to send fish first, so the nests don't plant. Once I fix that and send some more nests over to near the old base, I finish the biter objective, and all that's left now is the petroleum and probe goal. Both of these are just a matter of time now. Probes for the research to finish, and petroleum for the last few drones to produce. And wait, I do. I could, and perhaps should, spend time building up more production, but what I actually did was just bugger off and let it run. Coming back to fix any bottlenecks when they occur. It's not the most elegant ending, but I'd done all this work up to this point, and I'd be damned if I was doing any more. I come back and finish off the petroleum goal, and then I have a checkpoint to do prior to the final research of the run, being to place a tier 2 android. I should probably explain the probe goal now. You see, if you remember right back to the start of the run, I explained what a von Neumann probe is. A drone which is sent out into space, lands on a planet, produces copies of itself, and launches those out into the universe infinitely. These are our copies, which we're going to package into probes and send out to start their own little nullious runs on other planets. Finally, the probe research finishes and I can start producing the culmination of all of our efforts. For the low, low cost of most of the items I've ever produced in one way or another, and a crafting tree that looks like this, we've got ourselves a lovely little probe, which when launched, 
will give us a lot of science and like 10% of our final mission objective. Alright then, let's get a few other bastards launched. Soon enough, we launch our 10th and final drone. I'll just let you bask in this victory screen for a moment now. As 184 hours in game, 4 months of effort, all come to fruition here. All that's left to do now is return to where we began. Sit down on the shores of this once barren lake we crashed landed next to oh so long ago and watch over a grateful and life filled planet. Special thanks to my Ko-Fi supporters, Acrid Arsonist, Orom, Dick Dastardly Enthusiast, Scurvy, Watcher, Greenest God, Dr. Ducklumps, Shronkuvi, Leo, Das Tom, Thomas, Froxtrot9000, Nathan14321, Two Step SA, Hunter, The Fiendish, Michael Shawning, Justice, Hey1121, Japamela, Ion Burger, Pro Moron, Wap Dragon, Zach, Lula, Benjamin Gagney, MIG, Deadly Mitten, Dampire, Just Be Cool, Dyskin, and Rebo the Gazebo.